love now and Did you fall in love last time? I love love was stronger than anything. You the love of love. And I love you more than anything. There's still love. Love. From the New York Times, I'm Anna Martin. This is Modern Love. Today's story starts on a first date, a really good one. Jessica Slice was living in the Bay Area in California when she met a guy on OkCupid named David. David suggested they meet in the Berkeley Rose Garden for their first date. Take notes, people, that is a good first date spot. It doesn't always have to be a bar. When Jessica showed up to the garden, David had brought a bag of books based on things they'd been messaging about online. Jessica had brought something too, something a little less romantic. I had actually brought a strategy tile game with pictures of different bugs on it. Wow. Okay. (laughs) The truth is I often brought it on dates hoping that they would want to play it with me, that even if the date didn't work out, I might at least (laughs) get to play a few rounds of Hive. Oh, I love Hive. I love Hive. (gasps) Wait, you do? Yeah, I do. I'm really bad at it. I find it to be like literally the hardest game in the world. I can't believe you know Hive. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so portable. It's like you totally able to just throw it in your purse. I mean, what a dorky move. Okay, dorky, maybe, but I really admire it. Was David up for playing? Yeah. I asked if he liked games and he said, ah, oh, I kind of do. I I played chess a little bit as a kid, and then we kept talking about other things. Mm -hmm. And I found out about a month later that David was the number two chess player in the country under the age of under under the age of thirteen when he was seven. Oh, (laughs) he's a genius! (laughs) Yeah, it actually took googling him to find out. No way. So I think about that these indicators of what a good person he is like showed Mm. up even then Mm. because if I had been the number two chess player in the country I would have just worn a t-shirt absolutely indefinitely I mean it would be like the second thing I said after I introduced myself (laughs) like I am this is my name and I was the you know kid chess champion you write more about this first date with David in your essay can you read that for me sure David said he knew I was interested because of my body language I had turned to face him on the small wooden bench, tucking my feet under me and resting my arm on the backrest. But he had misread my body language. I was not trying to show I was interested. The truth is, benches hurt my body, and turning to the side was the only way to make sitting there tolerable. Leaning straight back against the wooden slats with David that day had nudged my ribs out of place. They ached. My bruised pelvis throbbed on the firm surface. Turning to the side allowed me to adjust my weight onto the meatier part of my bottom. I could use my arm to prop myself away from the wood. So you're clearly struggling physically. You're struggling with pain on this first date. What was happening to you at the time? So... Uh, I have something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder. And I also have POTS, which is a neurological condition that can make it very difficult for me to stand up or even sit up for long periods of time, um, impacts my ability to tolerate different temperatures and digestion. Mm -hmm. So all that made you quite uncomfortable sitting on this bench, but you didn't tell David right? You you didn't bring it up at all during your date. Why not? So I met David in 2015 and I had become sick in 2011. And I really started to realize that I was disabled in 2017. I think it can often take a while, or at least in my case, it took me a while to realize that the umbrella of disability is one I fit under And I struggled with when to mention that I was sick. You know, sometimes I brought it up on the first date. Sometimes I brought it up on a later date. You know, really, I never quite knew how to bring it into a conversation. But I had at that point been broken up with a few times because I was disabled. Mm. And so I was bringing that into my dates. I did feel self-conscious. One time I got a text 
from a guy that he had meant to send to his best friend. Oh, no. And it said, she's great and all, but I think a life with her would be too limited. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did, when I was dating, I did realize that that could continue happening. Mm. So you didn't tell David because you'd been burned by telling guys in the past. But I feel like David up to this point has given you every indication that he's like a very nice guy, not to mention, of course, a, a chess prodigy. And later on in this first date, he really sets himself apart. It happens when you tell him a story about a ride you took on BART, which is the public transit system in the Bay Area. Tell me about that. Sure. So we were sitting on the bench and a few days before I had gone to a concert in San Francisco and I had a situation on BART on the way back that had become sort of more and more ridiculous in my mind. And so I thought I would tell him this anecdote and entertain him. Mm -hmm. I was sitting on a seat and a man came and sat next to me and he was bleeding mm. and got in my face and started yelling at me and sort of spitting on me. And he didn't move. And so I couldn't get off at my stop. Mm. Um, and as I was telling David the story, I said, well, the whole thing was probably my fault because I sat on the window seat, leaving space for a person to get in my face on BART. Mm. And David stopped me there and got serious and said, I don't know what happened next, but whatever it was, it was not your fault. Mm. And... Something in that, like, it had it shifted my experience of the date a bit because he was not being entertained by me. He was really caring about my experience in the world. Mm -hmm. He cared about my emotions and my safety. He wasn't just seeing me as someone to accept or reject, that I had mm. already become a full person in his mind. Mm. You said that it sort of marked a shift for you. And I want to understand why his taking you seriously in this moment caused that shift. Yeah. I mean, it was the first time he started to feel unsafe and unfamiliar mm. because he was caring about me. Because kindness or reliability felt wrong. Hmm. And I texted my sister after and said... Oh, he's the greatest, but I doubt I go out with him again. C can you explain that to me a bit more? Why did David, being so kind and caring to you, feel so wrong in the moment? I did not think of dating as a chance to find the person I was compatible with who would be a partner for me. I think I thought of dating as a way for me to find out, um, am I lovable? Am mm. I good? Am I interesting? Am I a person worth dating or worth knowing? Mm. And I think that the, like, the natural extension of that was that if someone uh, was easy to win over, hmm. uh, then their admiration didn't mean as much. But if someone was unreliable or didn't show up when they said they would show up or didn't call. That to me meant like, okay, this is a higher level in this video game. And, and if I can beat that, then I am super lovable. So the harder you had to work to get someone's affection or admiration or time, that hard work meant it was worth it. Yeah. Did your disability play into your feeling of being unlovable? I don't know that that's, that played as big of a role as you would think. Hmm. And I think part of becoming disabled at 28 means that I carry with me the entitlement of being non-disabled for so many years. Huh. Uh-huh. And so, you know, I had these insecurities about if I was lovable, 
but I didn't have as many insecurities about uh, being sick or disabled. Mm. I don't know. I just kind of felt deserving <laughs> in my body. Mm -hmm. I had uh, about a half year before meeting David had mm -hmm. a long-term relationship end and it was, he said it was because I was too sick, that Ugh. he wanted a life that involved things that I couldn't do. Um, he wanted to be able to bike around remote Swedish islands together. He wanted to stay mm -hmm. up late at house parties. He had some very specific visions for his mm -hmm. life. And they were things that my body just simply couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, but... I just loved him so much. And I think part of the reason I loved him so much is like, I I always knew I was going to have to work extra hard to convince him I was good enough. Hmm. And even though he broke up with me because of my disability, the thing I worried about with him wasn't my disability. Hmm. I sort of thought if I was lovable enough or interesting enough, he would stay. It was like, the thing that I want is to convince the hardest person to convince that I am lovable. So then how did you handle guys like David who weren't hard to convince, who immediately showed you that they cared? Did you end up just losing interest in them? Definitely. I had. I remember the first time it happened, uh, I was in high school and I told a guy that I was dating that I was really craving peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. And he he lived four miles away. Okay. And he was on the track team and he made me a toasted peanut butter and jelly sandwich and oh. ran it to my house. Oh my gosh. And so I broke up with him. Okay. So even in high school, you're having this aversion to guys who show you that they like you. Mm -hmm. How about as you got older? Did you continue to do this to guys as an adult? Yeah, I thought it might take me a while to think of someone, but I did. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, that was immediate, yeah. Yeah, I went out with a guy who was very handsome. He was a professor, mm -hmm. funny and interesting. I could tell he was really into me. Mm. And, oh, I had a sick family member and he drove me to the hospital to visit them. And I thought, well, I'll never see this guy again. Did you understand why you were reacting in that way? No, I did not have that self-awareness at the time. Sure. I thought, oh, actually, as it turns out, this guy has an annoying voice. I just never realized it before. Um, but that happened to coincide with the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Right. Or this guy makes a weird facial expression, but that happened to be right after the hospital. So at the time, the way I would uh, justify it to myself mm -hmm. is by finding a few annoying things about them. Mm. So th the way he would talk or the way they would move or wear certain clothes or the mm -hmm. shape of a hand or anything, I would zero in on a thing mm -hmm. and think, well, that is just intolerable. Mm. You were searching for reasons to end things. Yeah, I don't think we are aware of the protective mechanisms we have in place. Otherwise, we wouldn't do them. But David made it clear from the beginning that he found you lovable, right? That he was interested in you, that he wanted to spend time with you. And that's so not what you want, but you went out with David again. Why? Well... I was in therapy and my therapist was mm -hmm. encouraging me to reconsider my approach to dating. I uh, was l living on social security disability insurance, so I was not working. You know, my illness was taking mm -hmm. up most of my energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had a lot of time and so I was journaling a lot. I was reading poetry for <laughs> maybe an hour every morning. Mm. My life allowed for a great deal of self-reflection. And so I think I just was in a place where I could override my natural instincts, which would be to never go out with David again and think, oh, maybe one more time. You actually go out with David 
more than once. You start dating him. You start seeing him very consistently. And I know that you said your disability was not the central reason for your hangups about dating or why you felt unlovable, but it was still something that you needed to tell David at some point. Can you talk about how that conversation went? It was one of our early dates and we were eating tacos on Telegraph Street in Berkeley. And we were just sitting there and I told him the whole thing. I told him about when I got sick, how hard it was to get a diagnosis, you know, how much had changed for me. I think that was the one thing that was so different is I could tell he wasn't doing a calculation about how this would impact his life. Hmm. He was hearing my story about how it had impacted my life. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to you that he wasn't making it about himself? At once, it made me feel incredibly seen and loved. And then it also made me think that something was probably very wrong with him. Hmm. It felt like he was just constantly attuned to me and to my needs. But Jessica, you don't like that. No. When someone's caring or kind to you, that's been your cue to run. So doubt, I'm sure, was starting to creep in with him, right? Yes, it was getting stronger and stronger. The nicer he was, the more I just wanted to immediately break up with him. But you didn't. You went on another date, this time to the movies. Can you read that part of your essay? Sure. He was standing outside a movie theater. He was wearing his cardigan, backpack, and boat shoes, and I couldn't take it a minute longer. His earnest love had become repulsive. Imagining the way he wanted to care for me, the inevitable loyalty and acceptance and protection filled my throat with bile. Filled your throat <laughs> with what, Jessica? With what? <laughs> with bile. I felt with disgusted bile. seeing him standing there waiting at the movies. Can you, that is such a strong reaction. Was that like a exaggeration or truly did you feel like bile rising in your throat? I truly felt it. I felt nauseated seeing him. So when you saw him in line at the movie theater mm -hmm. for that date mm -hmm. with his boat shoes, as you write, and his earnest love, and you feel that bile rise in your throat, that's the result of a buildup of all of these doubts you've been having about him. Right. It felt like I had been fighting myself to stay with him, and I couldn't do it. The urge to leave, I couldn't handle it another day. We'll be right back. So, Jessica, did you break up with David at the movies? We saw the movie, and then immediately after the movie, I said I had to go home, and then I emailed and broke up with him. That night. And wow. I did break up with him over email. Do you remember what you said? No. And I couldn't bear to look it up before talking to you either. I still, mm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I did read text messages with friends talking about the email. Mm. And I, I think it was just really to the point. I said, I can't continue dating you. You're wonderful. I wish you all the best. Oof. After you ended things with David, how were you doing? What were the days like that followed? Before talking to you, I went through my camera roll from that time. And mm -hmm. it's so funny to see because the first day I met up with my friend Ellie and we drove along the coast to, I think to Bolinas, but somewhere in Marin. And, mm -hmm. and I remember saying, oh, thank goodness I'm free. You know, when you know, you mm -hmm. know. And just these like trite, you know, he's just not the one for me. Totally. Better off without him. Yeah. What was the second day like after breaking up with David? Well, there was this house um, in Berkeley at the time where you could go 
and take off all your clothes and lie in the backyard. Mm -hmm. I just got to pop in and say, that is so Berkeley. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I'm jealous. And so I was lying naked under the redwood trees in this backyard. And I remember thinking, I hope he's not too sad. I wish I could check on him. Hmm. On the way from the house, I picked up some new wool for crocheting. And the next day, I really started to make a blanket. And as I was crocheting, Mm -hmm. I just started to think more and more about David. What were you thinking about when you thought of him? What image came to mind? Scenes from those months together and thinking about all the things I liked about him. When someone was nice to me, I would just start picking out all the things I didn't like about them. But when Mm -hmm. once I had broken up with David, it's like all his wonderful qualities bubbled up to the surface. So Mm. as I was crocheting, I was like, oh, God, he's so smart. And, oh, he's so funny. And remember this great thing we did together. And I wonder what Mm -hmm. he thinks about this movie that's coming out. He started to be in my mind in a really positive way. Mm. And this sense that I wanted to see him again and that maybe I actually loved him started to emerge from inside me. But wait, that that's that's big, Jessica. You you'd just, you know, a week earlier, you'd had bile in your throat at the sight of him. And now you're thinking that you might be falling in love. You might be in love with him. Yeah. And it and it felt like it was coming from a different part of me. It, it wasn't this mm. frantic, uh, reactive fear. It was mm-hmm. something deeper and something that felt true and a little quieter. Since that time, I've done so much thinking about intuition versus anxiety And I think the feeling of repulsion I had with people I went out with who were kind was a real feeling of sort of frantic anxiety, like flight or fight. Mm -hmm. And the feeling that I wanted to be with him again was coming from something like much more stable than that. It wasn't the frantic, like, get me out of here. It was something deeper in me and something a little more still. Mm. It's like a different center of certainty. And one feels like flailing on the outside or nausea. And the other one feels, um, I don't know, feels like a little quieter. And yeah, I think at that point with David, I was beginning to sense the difference between those two parts of myself. And I think when I broke up with him, maybe the loud child who was throwing a temper tantrum quieted down enough, and I had started to sense that I loved him. What did you do with that feeling? I waited. I made the Mm -hmm. blanket, which took me a while, and I saw my therapist, um, Mm -hmm. and I talked to friends, and I journaled, and... And then I finally reached out to him, I think maybe nine days later after breaking up with him Mm. and asked if we could meet up. And I had a blanket I wanted to give him. What did he say? He said yes. He was standoffish, I could tell, but he said okay. And so we met on the side of Lake Merritt near where he was living at the time. I told him I was sorry And he said, um, yeah, that email was not kind. The email breaking up with him. Yeah, he he deserved Mm -hmm. more. And and I think when I talk about David, sometimes it might sound like he's a pushover and because he's not. He he has incredible integrity and he he said that was not okay, but he wanted to hear what I had to say. And I tried my best to tell him what I was observing, which was that the nicer people were to me romantically, the more I wanted to run away 
and that I wanted Mm -hmm. to try to do it a little differently. Hmm. And that's when he said, yeah, I thought that might be what was happening. (laughs) And Hmm. he had bought a book that he had heard about on a podcast and the book was called The Fantasy Bond. And he read that book and learned that there's a theory in psychology that whatever happens to us in our earlier years, whatever those relationships look like, we try Mm -hmm. to replicate them as adults. Mm. And so if something was unhealthy when we were young, we try to find a relationship that will mimic that. It just perpetuates unhealthy cycles and that he Mm. suspected that what was happening is that I was just trying to, to repeat patterns um, mm. and that he had a lot of empathy for that. What were those patterns that he'd noticed that he thought you were replicating, that you believed you were replicating? I mean, in my situation, it was a combination of things. I think there was some early childhood experiences that had impacted me. And then there was some loss and inconsistency in my childhood that then I like was trying to replicate or that felt the most safe for me. I mean, did you explain to him directly that with previous partners, you'd run from stability and affection? Did you explain that all directly to him? I did explain that to him. He was like, yeah, that tracks. And I'm going to be consistent and you need to find a way to not run. And He said, you can't do that to me again. Mm -hmm. I can't just sit around while you're inconsistent. Mm. I mean, honestly, props to David for being so explicit with what he needs from you and and what he wants out of your relationship. I want to know, have you found a way not to run? Are you and David still together? We are. It's been eight years Mm -hmm. and we are very, very happy I don't know. Sometimes I, I'm in our home and I look at it from an outside perspective and I just think what a lucky couple. Uh, like we, we laugh so much. We are so consistently generous and kind to each other. Hmm. It's a safer and happier relationship than I could have imagined. You know, when you met David, you told me that you saw dating as a way to gauge how lovable you were. Mm -hmm. You felt like a relationship was only worth it if you had to work extremely hard and convince the other person to give you their care and affection. Mm -hmm. And now at this point, you know, eight years into your relationship with David, do you feel lovable even though you didn't have to convince him of your worth? Yeah, I'm pausing because I want to just make sure I tell the truth. I, yeah, I really feel lovable. Um, I feel that way on my own. I don't feel that David loving me is evidence of it. Um, I feel that as a person, I'm good and loved. And that I'm lucky enough to be with him. Mm. Jessica, thank you so much for talking with me today. Oh, thank you so much. This was really wonderful to think back through. Modern Love is produced by Julia Botero, Christina Josa, and Riva Goldberg. It's edited by our executive producer, Jen Poyant, and Annabelle Bacon. This episode was mixed by Daniel Ramirez. Our show was recorded by Maddie Masiello. The Modern Love theme music is by Dan Powell. Original music by Carol Sabaro, Pat McCusker, and Diane Wong. Digital production by Mahima Chablani and Nell Gologli. The Modern Love column is edited by Daniel Jones. Mia Lee is the editor of Modern Love Projects. I'm Anna Martin. Thanks for listening.